Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's Free CompTIA Network Plus Certification Training Course, the online training course that always saves room for dessert. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about troubleshooting common physical connectivity issues. This is certainly something that goes to the heart of people who are working on networks because we are run into all sorts of problems. This comes from our Network Plus certification in 10 004, section 4.7, where given a scenario, we need to troubleshoot common connectivity issues and select an appropriate solution. Now, as an aside here, if you had a very early version of the CompTIA Network Plus certification requirements, the 2009 requirements, there were a number of typographical errors that have since been changed. But you need to be aware that if you saw something on the certification requirements that said you need to understand nearing crosstalk, well, I think what they really meant to say was near end crosstalk. And if you look at the latest uh, set of uh, requirements that are from the CompTIA website, they've corrected that issue. Another one is that uh, they had right under shorts, they had open impedance mismatch or echo. What that really should be is shorts and open, and then another bullet that said impedance mismatch. So we've already made those corrections in here, but I wanted to be sure that if you were working on this from that documentation, the early documentation from the CompTIA website, just keep that in mind. So just a few problems associated with that. And if you have the latest version, you'll see that those problems aren't even there anymore. They've already corrected it. Let's start talking about physical issues. Boy, here's a picture of what must be a very challenging physical plant. It's just a wall of, of wire. You don't even know where something starts and where something ends. Not really a situation you want to find yourself in. The idea, of course, is that the network is only going to be as good as the physical plant on which it runs. And so we need to make sure that the cabling infrastructure, that the fiber infrastructure that we have is up to spec for what we're doing on this network. Fortunately, uh, we're getting much better at this. It's very difficult to find a situation where somebody's network is quite so busy with all of these cables anymore. Most everybody has a pretty good idea of what they should be doing with wiring. There's some very nice wiring standards that we in the industry have created over these last 15 years. And now people have become accustomed to making sure that the physical plant is in really good shape. Obviously, there's still some room for improvement there. And the idea when you're ever you're working with wiring is do it right the first time. It's very rare that you have an opportunity to go back and readjust things afterwards. When you've already plugged in equipment and it's up and running and it's in production, you can't just unplug cables and move them back around and try to straighten things up from what you did. If you put them in and fix them right the first time, you'll never have to go back. And you'll find that the number of problems that you're having with your physical infrastructure will also be decreased because you were able to really make sure that this was well implemented and well installed from the very beginning. Let's start talking about some of these physical problems you'll have. One of the physical problems that we commonly talk about with wiring is something called crosstalk. Crosstalk is defined as when energy is from, from a signal going through a wire crosses from one pair of the wire to the other. And you're going to find this becomes extremely important, especially on these very short runs that we have uh, and long runs that we have when this, this signal gets to the other end. We don't want to have any type of bleeding or crossover of that signal from one, one pair of wires to the other. The way this usually works, of course, is with Ethernet cabling, for instance, there's a pair for transmit and there's a pair for receive. So we want to make sure that our transmit side doesn't overpower and get into that receive side. And you'll notice if you look at a, a piece of cable, those cables, those wires are really close to each other. So there's going to be some type of energy transfer between them. We need to understand how much and make sure that is it is within specification for the type of cabling we're using and the type of networking that we're doing at the speeds that we're running on that network. The idea for crosstalk and to be able to minimize it is that we need a lot of twists. If you twist the cable, what you'll find is that the amount of crosstalk is decreased. And that's why whenever we talk about punching down cables, we talk about buying category five and category six cables, you'll notice that they're very tightly twist, twisted pair. And that's because having that twist in there really helps a lot with the crosstalk. The more twists you have, generally speaking, the better it's going to be for making sure the crosstalk doesn't occur.
we measure crosstalk in decibels. That's the term that we use to determine how much sound, how much noise is go going across that wire. And it's measured in negative numbers, although we don't always write it that way. Almost never do you see that the crosstalk is 30 decibels. What we're really saying is the crosstalk is only allowing one thousandth of the signal to come through on the other side. That means that when we start looking at crosstalk, that a, a higher number here, a negative 40, even though we only write it as 40 decibels, it's much better than 30. Uh, whenever we look at these decibels, notice it's a logarithmic scale, which means 3 dB means that it's twice the signal strength. 10 dB is 10 times, 20 dB is 100 times, and so on. So you can see once we get down to 30 and 40 dB, you're only getting 10,000th of the signal that is being crosstalked into the other pair of wires. So obviously you can see why the 40 dB is a much better crosstalk value than the 30 dB. We talk about this as something called near and crosstalk. And that's where we're measuring the amount of crosstalk that occurs right where the signal is going into the wire. That's because whenever that signal is going right in that side, it's really going to be at its strongest level. So it's a great place to determine how much crosstalk is getting into that other side. And that's really going to be useful when you use one of these uh, wire or cable testers to be able to do that examination. I can sit in one place, and it will send a signal out and immediately start hearing what it's receiving from the other side. And it's all happening right there on the near end. And that's why we call it near end crosstalk. We're going to need some type of specialized equipment to do this. Normal Ethernet cards that are in a server aren't going to be able to determine what the near end crosstalk is. You have to have something that's very specialized, that's really specific to crosstalk. And it does usually these devices do many other things as well. Transmits that signal and just listens. And as I mentioned, if we get less crosstalk, the better. So that negative 40 decibels versus negative 30. And notice here I even wrote it the right way. I said just 40 decibels is better than 30 decibels. It's always going to imply that negative. So that's why whenever we're looking at crosstalk, we want to be sure we've got these high numbers for crosstalk. And if you're trying to determine how much should you have and not have, usually these devices are going to tell you for the type of signal strength you're doing, maybe you're running at 100 megabit through this Category 5 cable. This passes or it fails based on the crosstalk number. So once you have that piece of equipment, it really helps a lot. Another important statistic to determine whenever you're working with these physical plants is something called attenuation. And attenuation is very simply signal loss. It's how much power you're losing as the signal goes down a cable. And on copper cables, attenuation can be pretty drastic. You notice that if you look at specifications for Ethernet, we're looking at a maximum length of generally about 100 meters to be able to run wire. That's because our signal gets so weak when it gets to the other end that we can't guarantee that we're going to be able to pull out that Ethernet traffic that's going through there. We also represent uh, attenuation the same way we represented our near and crosstalk. It is as decibels. So this is a minus sign again to this decibel value. Obviously, when we're working with these things, you'll become very accustomed to working with those numbers of decibels. Here's a good example of what the standards happen to say. They say that if you are running an IEEE 568A, which is a very common cabling type, 568A and 568B, the attenuation can only be down to 24 decibels. We need to make sure that we don't go any further than that. And if we go back to looking at our, our design of the number of decibels, you know that 20 decibels decrease is a hundredth of the signal. That means that this is pretty impressive. I can have the signal strength drop by uh, to 1 one hundredth of its orig original strength, and it's still in specification for that 100 megahertz signal if I'm running at 100 megabit over that link, for instance. That's pretty impressive. That means that my Ethernet equipment is designed so that it can only receive a hundredth of that signal strength and still be able to operate properly within specification. This is why we're dealing with these very, very tiny little numbers and very, very small slivers of signal strength. Now you understand why it's so important that you get a good punch down, that you make sure you have good quality cabling, and that you're using some really good test equipment. Because very often, it's very small amounts of signal strength that we're dealing with here. And we have to have something that's very attuned, and very specific, and very sensitive to these signal strength in order to be able to give us some valid measurements. Now, I realize this module is on physical network problems. But one of the things that was listed in this types of physical issues in the CompTIA 
do- documentation is something called collisions. Now, collisions aren't necessarily a physical problem. They're really part of how Ethernet works in a half duplex mode in order to arbitrate the signal. Who gets to talk over a cable that's, uh, that's an Ethernet connection? So although we're in this physical environment, this is not a physical issue, although a num- amount of the cabling and the signal that's going across does work at the physical level, obviously. Now, if you are having physical problems, if you're having a lot of crosstalk, if you have a lot of attenuation on your network, this could actually cause some issues and cause a number of collisions for Ethernet when it's occurring. So somehow we're sort of blending together a couple of different ideas of our physical plant and perhaps layer two type arbitration with Ethernet. But just keep that in mind that a collision is not not completely a physical type of problem. Now, if you're dealing with full duplex Ethernet, and I would say a huge percentage, a vast majority of networks out there are almost completely full duplex Ethernet these days. And if you're dealing at a full duplex Ethernet, you don't have collisions. It doesn't occur. Full duplex means there is one channel for sending traffic and one channel for receiving traffic. So you don't have to get into these issues of signals colliding because you've created separate channels for each of those. They will never collide, which of course is one of the advantages of running running in full duplex. That's why we really don't think about collisions much anymore unless you have a small network, you're running with an older hub, and maybe it's a a legacy type network. Otherwise, you're really not going to run into collisions very much. Although we don't deal with them much, I thought it would be nice to have a look at what these collisions really are. And I mentioned earlier that collisions are part of Ethernet and the way that it arbitrates who talks on the network. Collisions occur when more than one workstation communicates across the network at a time. So here's an example. I've got one station that's O'Neill, another one that's Carter, and they're both trying to talk to this server that's called Gate1. So one of the things that they'll do is they'll send their traffic off to the server. And if this is a half duplex Ethernet, the packets go through the network and they collide. This is a normal part of Ethernet. We call it collision. It has such a bad name. Oh, we had it had data that collided. Well, that's what happens on half duplex Ethernet. That's a normal part of Ethernet. Don't be afraid of collisions. We just have to, what normally happens with Ethernet though, is those two stations can listen on the network. They hear that the data collided. There's a signal change when that data collides. And so we, though both of those stations know they weren't able to talk to the gate one server. What happens then is they wait. There's a random waiting time that they wait for. And once they wait, they begin retransmitting. And because of the randomness associated with this, one station will communicate first, and then the other station will communicate across the network. And hopefully, they don't collide again. If they do collide again, they wait for another random amount of time, and they send more information across the network. That is the normal part of collision. So if we're thinking about Are we colliding with traffic on the network? Is it being caused by the normal communication between systems? Or is it being caused because I might have a problem with my wire and these stations just think there are collisions occurring out on the network? Well, that's a test you'll have to do during your troubleshooting process. But that's why when we talk about collisions, it's not purely a troubleshooting at the physical layer type issue. It may be just something that's happening normally. One of the challenges when working with cabling and working with wire is that that copper that's inside of there really doesn't isn't able to bend very much. It doesn't tolerate a lot of rubbing against it. If you've ever worked in an environment where somebody's taken the desk that they're working at and they shove it against the wall right against that Ethernet connector and it bends the cable, you may find that they're now having problems communicating on the network because now they bent those cables onto each other and created a short. That's what a short is. It's when we take two wires and they are connecting to each other and the signal that normally would be separated in those wires is now shared across both of those wires. If you've ever seen an electrical short, you know that can be quite a bit of fireworks. That's something you don't want. Usually in, in networking, we don't see a lot of electrical type shorts. Usually it's when wires have just been crimped or pushed against the wall or they are now connecting on the really bad punch downs and they're connecting with each other. So we just need to put a new cable in place. We need to fix our punch down so that those two wires are not connecting to each other. And open is, well, it's almost the opposite of that. It means we have a gap. That means that the wire itself, there is an opening. It is not completing the circuit. And in a networking environment, opens are bad. We are just losing signal completely. There's not even a sharing of signal that we have when we're dealing with shorts. The signal just completely stops. And we're not able to get signal from one side to the other. If we cut a cable, 
that's an open, technically speaking. And now we have to resolve that. We have to patch that together. We have to replace the cable so that we don't have those opens and so that the signal can go from one end to the other without being stopped somewhere in the middle. A more subtle kind of signal problem is something called an impedance mismatch. And if you can imply by the term impedance, we're impeding the flow. We're restricting the flow in some way of, of communication from one side to the other. And impedance is that. It's this opposition to a signal as it's flowing through a wire, flowing through a cable, flowing through a fiber. Every time you have a break in that wire, every time you put a connector onto a wire, every time that you're plugging into a patch, there's going to be some level of impedance. And you're going to find that that impedance is measured usually in a number of ohms. You may see this with any type of cabling. You may see it with uh, microphones, with speakers that you've put in your house. It works exactly the same way. We need to make sure that the wiring that we use has a relatively low impedance so that the signal can flow completely at its signal strength, the maximum signal strength, all the way down the line. Every place where there is some impedance, you're going to get some reflection back. You're going to get some of that signal coming back at you. If it's just a small impedance mismatch, it's only a tiny little, little bit of signal reflected back to you. If it's a big impedance mismatch, it's going to be a lot of signal reflected back at you. This becomes very common on the very traditional POTS networks, the plain old telephone system, because those are, go from a two-wire configuration uh, go from a four-wire configuration down to two-wire and back again if it's going the other direction. So there is an impedance mismatch there. And usually what you'll hear this represented as is echo. You'll be talking into the phone and you'll hear echo coming back. Part of our telephone systems have these echo cancellation pieces of equipment or software built into their equipment so that if there are echoes coming back down the line, they inside of their digital signal processing get rid of the echo so you don't hear it. So it helps a little bit when you have these very bad impedance problems and it cleans up a lot of those issues. But you're, if you're on a voice network, you've punched down some configurations and you're hearing a lot of echo, maybe because there's a lot of impedance, go check your connectors again. Make sure you're not using different kinds of wire, different gauges of wire, and make sure that that signal is able to flow freely from one side of that link to the other. The last type of physical problem we'll talk about is interference. And interference is when something that's external to your network is now conflicting. It's causing a problem with the traffic flows that are on your network. These external influences might be mobile phones, fluorescent lights. They have some very, very loud and noisy electronics in there to networks. Microwave ovens can kill a wireless network. If you have other wireless uh, portable phones, mobile phones that are in your environment that run on wireless frequencies, that can cause interference. And sometimes we've been in a building where somebody's desk was right on top of the power coming into the building. So there were some large transformers in the basement. They were on the first floor right above it. They were having massive amounts of interference. And we couldn't figure out why until we brought some equipment in and noticed there was a lot of interference coming from those generators underneath. We moved their desk and got rid of that interference. These noisy environments, especially when you're in places like manufacturing facilities, there's printing presses, there's warehouses, there's large pieces of equipment that are causing interference. You may not be able to move anybody's desk around. You may not be able to move the equipment to even get around the interference. So what you'll find in environments like that, they almost always use fiber. Because light, you really would have to cut the fiber to have a problem with the light. Uh, fluorescent lights and microwave ovens, they won't affect the light running through a fiber. So you, those become perfect when you're in those very noisy type of environments. Let's find out how much we've learned about troubleshooting the physical connectivity on our network. Our first question, what measurement tells you how much signal is heard across other pairs of wires? It's one of the first things we talked about, and that's called crosstalk. You'll also hear it measured as near-end crosstalk. Also, we have a question, what describes the loss of signal? When signal's going through a wire, it will lose signal as it goes along, and we describe that as being attenuation. The last question is, which condition reflects the signal back onto the cable? Which means that we're trying to have that flow go all the way down the cable, and it's reflected back to us because there is some impedance mismatch that's occurring as it goes along its way and goes through different links of that cable. Well, that goes through a lot of different troubleshooting physical connectivity issues. Our crosstalk, near and crosstalk, we talked about collisions and opens and impedance mismatches. And at this point, you should have a pretty good idea of the types of things you should look for whenever you're trying to troubleshoot these physical issues. 
Thanks for joining us in this module. If you'd like to see many more of our videos, come to our message boards and communicate with other people that are looking at our Network Plus certifications, or if you just want to send me a message, you can visit our website, freenetworkplus.com.